Good evening, and welcome to the November 2017 edition of League of Women Voters Presents, the monthly public affairs show about topics that are important and interesting to mid-Missouri and beyond. My name's Randy Picht. I'm the executive director of the Donald W. Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism, and I'm filling in for regular host Jim Robertson tonight. And uh, tonight, you know, one of the things, I've been in Columbia for about five and a half years, and uh, one of the things that never ceases to amaze me is that there are all these kind of unexpected um, things that you find out about Columbia, and it's still happening to me uh, here. I've been here five and a half years, and um, tonight we're going to talk about one of those things. Um, and it's one of the, it's, it's something that is kind of a hidden treasure, um, something I drive by to get to work every day. And it's also something that's uh, a little unique in the United States. I think the University of Missouri is one of 24 universities that has what we're going to talk about. Uh, and what that is, is it's a nuclear reactor uh, on campus. Um, and I have two experts with me who are at the reactor, and we're going to talk all about uh, the history of it, what it does now, and what it will be doing uh, down the road. So I'm going to ask uh, my panelists to introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. So my name is Dave Robertson. I'm a professor of chemistry, and I'm the associate director for research and education at the research reactor. Okay. Thanks. And my name is Ken Brooks. And I'm the Associate Director for Business Development, so great scientific breakthroughs that happen with Dave's team that translate into something that uh, needs some business support, well, that's where I would step in and help out. So you're the money guy. You could say that, <laughs> okay. right? There's a team of us. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> All right, so, um, so why don't we start with the basics, but, but um, what, what, what's the difference between a nuclear reactor that we read about that generates power and kind of what what we have on campus? Great question. So uh, what they have in common, okay. right? both a nuclear reactor that makes power and our research reactor, they have uranium that we fission or we split the atom into two or more pieces. Right? And that's where the similarity stops. <laughs> okay. okay. So a nuclear power reactor like the one that we have in Callaway fissions or splits uranium for the energy. Lots of energy is emitted in that process. Callaway captures that energy, turns it into steam, uses that steam to drive a turbine, which makes electricity. That's what a nuclear power reactor does. Okay. Our nuclear research reactor, we literally throw away the energy from the fission process. We don't harness it. What we capture from the fission process, and I'll take you back to your uh, high school chemistry class. The building blocks of the atom are a neutron and a proton in the middle, and then the electrons around that. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. If I want to do science with one of those building blocks, a proton, I can buy a tank of hydrogen gas here in town. I can take the electron off of it, and I have protons, and I can do all the science I want. But if I take the neutron out of the atom, the neutron isn't stable. In fact, once I remove it from the atom, we were talking earlier, it becomes a melting ice cube. The neutron has a half-life of about 10 minutes. What that means is, if I have a bottle of neutrons, which I can make, in 10 minutes, half of them are gone. In 20 minutes, I only have 25% of them. So if I want to do science with a neutron, I have to continually make them. Mm -hmm. Our research reactor is a very bright source of neutrons. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's one of the brightest sources in the nation. Mm -hmm. We're equivalent to the best facilities in the national labs in the Department of Energy. So that's the difference between the two. And the brightest, what do you mean by brightest? Brightest means... Um, 
so you think of a light bulb, right? A dim light bulb, not very many photons, not okay. much light coming out. A very bright light bulb, right? Lots of photons coming out. So the same idea with our nuclear reactor. We are a very intense source of neutrons, very bright source. And that's really what distinguishes us from the other 23 reactors that you mentioned. We're the largest, in terms of intensity and power, reactor on any campus in the United States. Yeah, well, see, hidden treasure, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. All right, so, so Ken, how long has this reactor been around? Right, so we came online first in 1966. So it doesn't take you long to do the math. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary. It was a big deal. 50 years of safe and reliable operation that really enabled the kinds of research that uh, Dave and his team and those who came before have done that really has translated to all kinds of things that benefit humankind today. And the, the cancer research and the treatments that are available today that's really come along through all that. So 50 years ago is when it all started. 50 years. So it's been here yeah. for 50 years mm -hmm. doing all kinds of interesting things. So why don't we talk about some of the interesting things that you've done over 50 years and then maybe we can talk a little bit about kind of what, what what's you got, coming up what's on the on the whiteboard yeah. okay um, well let me give you a couple of examples um, you know using neutrons right that that's our advantage that we can make them and we can harvest them so neutrons are kind of like the uh, x-ray that your dentist uses right so you go to the dentist's office right and they put a piece of film or a detector in your mouth and they shine x-rays through right and oh you have a hole there mm -hmm. well neutrons have that similar property mm. and so in the world of, of physics and material science we use neutrons to look at how the atoms in a material are put together now you would think chemists and physicists when they make something would know exactly how everything's put together but we don't we need a tool to tell us right how things are assembled mm -hmm. And when it comes to, for example, making a new class of very powerful but lightweight magnets, how the atoms are assembled in mm -hmm. that material is really important. Right. So years ago at the research reactor, faculty in engineering and physics worked with industry to develop the uh, strong, lightweight magnets that are now in all automobiles mm. because if you want to improve the fuel efficiency of a car you don't want a really heavy iron magnet you want a lightweight magnet that still works very well as the starter motor in your car mm. and so through that interaction and work uh, with industry doing that research they were able to start with things that worked pretty well understand why they worked pretty well, design the next generation of materials, and now everyone buys that material called MagnaQuench. Hmm. Okay, so auto industry, what, what are some of the other industries that you typically sure. work with? So again, you know, giving you a history of some of our, our research successes. Um, years ago, a faculty member in the College of Electrical Engineering at the University of Missouri, uh, picked up on an idea in the Russian literature of all places, right, that you could use neutrons to do alchemy. Mm. Now I'll remind you what wow. alchemy, right? Yeah. So alchemy is turning lead into gold, right? We're, we can do that, but it costs you a lot of energy, right? <laughs> you, it would just be better off going out and digging up the gold, <laughs> okay? But uh, what what the uh, what we do as alchemy is we use neutrons to turn beach sand into something more valuable than gold. Mm. Right? Wow. And so uh, the University of Missouri pioneered taking silicon, super pure silicon, which comes from beach sand, which is the building block for semiconductor devices. Mm -hmm. okay? Well, the way that you turn silicon into a semiconductor device is you dope it with different materials and you have to get just the right of material there and then you get a semiconductor that works in your cell phone or in your computer or, okay the use of a neutron to make that happen to take some silicon atoms and turn them into phosphorus atoms in our reactor we can control that process so well that we can make a semiconductor material that behaves exactly as we predict 
with high currents and high voltages or a high power application. Well, for years and years after we developed that process and we began putting cylinders of super pure silicon in the reactor to make this material, um, that, that material was used by the Defense Department and other agencies for uh, very special properties. But today, almost all of that material goes into your hybrid automobile if you drive one. Because if you think about it, you're driving down the road and you want to switch between your gasoline-powered engine and your electric power, that's going to be an event that is a very high power, right? It's a heavy vehicle, lots of energy involved. When you make that switch, there's a lot of power involved in that. And you want that switch to work thousands of times. That's the material that we create turning beach sand into, when it comes out as a chip, on a per mass basis, it's more valuable than gold. Hmm. Wow. And if you like to translate how that all works, so that was in the 70s when mm -hmm. uh, Murr and the scientists there were really pioneering all of that. And then to this very day, that's one of the services that we provide where we routinely irradiate the silicon ingots for that purpose. And that creates a revenue stream that then allows us to fund other research that will take us, who knows where research will take us, right? So that's sort of the, the whole model of how some things can work. It's great breakthroughs in science that lead to some application in actual uh, industry in some way and then they can generate revenue and here we go and then we fund the next breakthrough mm -hmm. and then the next breakthrough. You know that's interesting and I want to hear more some more success stories but um, this idea that you almost are the complete pipeline of breakthrough you know do the mm -hmm. research figure something out and in a lot of places then it's hand it over to industry for them to turn it into something or to manufacture stuff. Now, in this case, you guys are doing the whole thing, right? Is that kind of standard or is that like, is this an exception to, you know, or I guess, and what is it, how, how do you approach that in terms of 80% research, pure research, 50% pure research, or do you even look at the world that way? Why don't you answer yeah, the first take, question, yeah. and I'll answer the last question. Yeah, right. I think that'll work out yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, so let's. Uh, we haven't yet really spoken about the radio pharmaceutical world and how that works, but it's a it's the best example to speak to your question of where we fit on the whole tr uh, value chain and, and all the way through the pipeline. So what we might happen in an early stage of a radio pharmaceutical development, some things might happen on the bench tops here or scientists that our scientists collaborate with, and ultimately we could at the reactor and in our laboratories create not only the active ingredient but then the targeting agent that combined together would make the radio pharmaceutical. And then so just so radio pharmaceutical mm. what, what is that? Fair question. Um, it depends on what you're trying to do. It either can be for a diagnostic purpose just to tell you what's going on inside your heart. Is the blood still flowing or do you have a blockage? Or it could be something that's actually targeting to a cancer tumor for the purpose of killing it. So okay. it can be either, depending on what we're trying to do. Okay, but it's, and that's it's, the generic sort of radioactive pharmaceutical, if you will. Okay, and yeah. this is this gets injected into somebody's body, and either somebody's watching what happens or hoping. Okay, for right. sure, for sure. Okay. So as we think about then this whole pipeline and and how MER fits in in the context of radio pharmaceuticals, we can make the active ingredient. We could in our labs formulate it into final drug, but we're only going to do that on small scale. Then when it gets to a high volume, right, commercially approved drug, where we're going to do is we're going to step back in the value curve a little bit, and we're going to be the radioactive or active ingredient provider, and we can do that in bulk. And then that's going to go to someplace else where it's manufactured into the final drug and then distributed to the U.S. and abroad. Okay, so, so, we, so we do the full value chain for a while, and then we sort of step back once it gets to a level of success, and then we turn our attention to the next thing while we're providing this active ingredient routine. So it's kind of like get, get it started and then once somebody else takes it on then you, you take a role that makes more sense probably more for, for, for your size and what, right. what your mission is. That kind That's of, right. right. But it's also we're, we're the only people that can do it. Mm -hmm. Right. So unlike lots of research and development that you get your patent, right? Industry comes in and buys your patent or licenses your patent and takes it over and okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Industry doesn't have 
the world's largest university research reactor. Right. Right. And uh, so we 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 will always be part of the chain because they need us. Either they need the neutrons to make the material behave differently, or we need the neutrons to make the radioactive ingredient in the radioactive drug. Mm -hmm. Right. So we we always have a role. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you were going to take question two, which I don't right. remember. Question anymore. two, you were asking me, how do we think about, you know, we, we are a university research reactor, right? And our, our mission, right? What, what drives us is research and education, right? We're kind of a complicated organization in that, you know, we're, we're a three-legged stool. We have the research and education mission, right? Which is really a bunch of people that we want to be as creative as possible. We want to have an environment so they can just pursue all sorts of ideas. I describe them as cats. Okay? <laughs> so we have the cats. Okay? okay? Then, then, then need to be herded. And I try to herd them, but I'm not very good at <laughs> okay. it. Okay? But, but we have the cats. And, and, and so, but the other two legs of our stool are just as important. Right? So we have the products and services and business development portion. Because you can probably imagine... That a facility of our size, 170 employees here within the university, right? Um, it it would it's it's quite a uh, a large budget, right, to run such a facility. And uh, fortunately, because of the giants who came before Ken and I, right, we have all of these products and services that we can provide to the nation, to industry, and to people that bring in revenue, right. which we then use to pay for this very large operation. Mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's just as important of a leg, right? And we have to pay attention to it. And, and, and Ken's side of the shop does a great job. Um, in fact, when we go and meet with our customers, um, at first we thought it was an insult. Okay? We'd go and meet with our customers, and they'd say, you know, we never think about you guys. Oh. Well, what they meant with that is, you folks are so reliable that we don't worry about you. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're completely dependent upon you for this product, mm -hmm. but right, we That's don't worry about you. That's a testament to a lot of people that, that really, day in and day out, keep things operating at right. the reactor, yeah. for sure. So, so that's, one, that's the second leg. And then the third leg, which, you know, if you have a nuclear reactor with a bunch of cats in it, you want to know that this <laughs> third leg exists, right? The third leg is the operations portion of the reactor. Mm -hmm. And the operation portions of the reactor, um, we have to be very careful there, right? We have to make sure we operate the reactor in a way that always ensures the safety of the public and of our staff, right? right? And so there, we are overseen by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and there are lots of rules, and okay? And we must always abide by those rules, right? So a very regulated portion of the house, but a portion of the house that in, 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 in maintaining that safe operation also maintains a reliable operation. And so bottom line, we're the only reactor in the world. Power, research, doesn't matter. We are the only reactor in the world that runs 52 weeks a year, year in and year out. Wow. And Ken can speak to part of the motivation for doing that in the field of radio pharmaceuticals, sure. but um, we're able to do that. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, you hear about the week of maintenance at the power plant, you know, the, this kind of stuff. You guys have to If we had weeks of maintenance, yeah. cancer patients next week wouldn't get their radio pharmaceutical. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if I could just make a comment here, this yeah. might be the place to just sort of point out that, you know, the University of Missouri has brought three radio pharmaceuticals to market. And two of those, to this day, we continue to provide the active ingredient. And the shelf life of the drug is short. So one of them that we talk about sometimes is Quadramet. And it has an active ingredient with a short shelf life. We ship the active ingredient every Monday. It goes to Boston, where it's formulated into drug. And then shipped to hospitals, and it's useful Wednesday, Thursday, and through Friday noon, at which point the drug expires. Wow. So every week, right out of Columbia, Missouri, we're the sole supplier for the nation. If we don't provide that active ingredient every week, then those patients who are expecting that treatment will not get it. Wow. 
Oh, so that's pretty powerful. And what does the shipment look like? Like, is it mm. like bigger than a bread box? Or yeah, it actually looks like a beer keg. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a. It's about that size. Cut. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, I know. That's, we'll I, edit that out. Don't <laughs> worry. I, I don't know how. I don't know how I know what a beer keg looks like. Okay. Yeah, right. But that's actually what they look like. Now those containers, now, of course, are certified as well. Right. 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 And they were drop tested and fire tested and all the kind of things that you would imagine hit by a train kind of force all those things that you would imagine to prove that they would retain their integrity and you ship it to one place in boston or you, you so ship for, that to multiple yeah so for that particular example okay. we ship that to boston uh, other things we ship other places but that was just an example and they're, of they're all ones. of that same kind of shelf life where similar some aren't quite that short some are more like in the two week range okay but but it's all a matter of Logistics and timing and reliability is, is key in that. Yeah, with that short shelf life, if, if there's any production delay right. or, or interruption, it's... Mm -hmm. it's very, patients are affected. Yeah. Right. And so that takes, right, that, that takes all three parts of that stool, mm -hmm. right? Right. To make it happen. Yeah. And so with that background, right, of sort of how the... You asked me the question, you know, how do we, how do we sort of uh, uh, divide up the research, right? Is it, is it you know, 50% development? 50% pure research or 80, 20 or whatever. And, and the way I would answer that is the following. Um, I don't think of it that way as the director for research. Right? Um, the way I think of it is I want to hire the best and brightest people that I can attract to the University of Missouri at Columbia who want to work in the fields of nuclear science. Right? And then I want to create an environment where they feel like they can succeed and have the freedom to pursue all of these ideas. And fortunately, because of the support from the business development and the products and services, we can also provide them resources to help them get going to the point at which they are then successful in obtaining extramural funding for the ideas that they want to work on. So the researchers really, I ask them to spend their time doing research with a, a small percentage of their time helping us when a, the appropriate problem comes up. For them to work on. Okay. Uh, but part of my team then, Ken, will get an inquiry from industry. This happened two years ago. Amazingly, there is an isotope that the entire semiconductor industry in the United States depends upon. It doesn't go in your cell phone or right, your computer, but it, it's needed in the manufacturing process right, to keep everything as clean as possible. Right? And this isotope, uh, while it is, I would say, key for the nation, Right, so that we can make all of our mm -hmm. electronics. Right, it, its only supplier at the time was Russia. Oh. Right. So American industry contacted Ken, said, mm -hmm. "What can we do?" Right. Now it's a longer shelf life, so we're not dealing with the same kind of things we would in a radio pharmaceutical context, but we're still dealing with geopolitical difficulties, transportation difficulties, right? Sure. And in by virtue of anything that's of a this kind of nature, you can't stockpile it, even though you can stockpile it for a little while. In the case of what Dr. Dave was talking about, you can't stockpile it forever. Right. So yeah, so they came along and they contacted me and I'm like, I don't know if we can do that or not. Hey Dave, can we do that? And that was two right. years ago? Mm -hmm. Right, a couple years. And are we doing it now? We are. And and um, so this was, I, I tell you this story as an example of, of how the research team contributes to the development. So Ken brings us the problem. Mm -hmm. I, I create a small team at Murr. We look at it, and of course, with industry, we want to be mindful of, well, we don't want to create a lot of waste, you know, we want to make sure that it's an efficient process, right? So all sorts of things. And uh, a great team took us about a year to go from the literature to a system that we then took up to the industry for them to process this isotope and put it into their product. And today, every two weeks, I believe, they receive a shipment from us. Oh, boy, that's great. That's a great success story. Yeah, it really is. It, it is. really is. So we're, we're almost out of time, mm. uh, but I, but I want to talk about kind of what's coming up. Okay. And maybe a little bit about Discovery Ridge, some things mm. that you're thinking about there, and um, what else you guys have in the pipeline. So I think I want to briefly tell the story about Lutathera because some break, breaking news there. So. Sure. Our folks have been working, Dr. Dave and his team, for years to provide a, an isotope from, known as lutetium-177. It was used in what's an, in a drug that's now known as Lutathera. And within the last two months, Lutathera was approved 
in the European marketplace. It's the first drug of its nature, of a Theranostic category, and we don't really have time to get into that. But in, in really broad brush strokes, it treats a pancreatic cancer that spreads to the midgut region. And generally, we would just call it pancreatic cancer. Um, and we all know that that's a fatal diagnosis, uh, absent something. And Lutathera is wildly effective. Uh, and 70 to 80 percent of the patients respond, and you get multi-year life extension. We're not sure how long they're going to live because they're still living from a typical four to six month time horizon, right? Wow. So that's great. We worked really hard to try to get that company when and they're out of Italy. And then uh, when they were deciding where to locate in the U.S., we worked really hard to get them to set up at Discovery Ridge. They weren't quite ready to do that. They located on the East Coast. But that's an example of the kind of companies that we would work with. And when they come through the pipeline and then they're looking to set up a manufacturing site, we're going to work really hard to get them to set up at Discovery Ridge. The university has been supportive of that. And the whole logistics story is really quite compelling, right? You've got these melting ice cubes, handle them quickly, get them from the reactor to a site nearby, and then you can distribute geographically in the U.S. from a central location, and it's really quite a compelling story. And now, is that, is, is that some a kind of a new approach now, That because you, you have the capability of, of offering folks a place to go? You didn't have that? That's right. Years, years ago, ago, in the 80s, and some of the stuff that was really done originally, you know, uh, all the East Coast was sort of the hub for that, and that's sort of where we would, we would send uh, active ingredients, and it would all sort of happen there. And now we're working really hard to get that hub moved, or at least sort of a, a, an additional hub here. And, and we're having some success. Yeah. yeah, that's great. And Dave, any thoughts about kind of new cool things that mm -hmm. the cool cats are working on? So, um, I'll, uh, you know, following on the Lutathera, okay? So this radioisotope placed in a molecule, right, that that when I inject it into your bloodstream, seeks out the cancer cells, right, in, in your midgut. And again, very, very effective, right? And, and for your audience, right, I'll remind you, this is the disease that killed Steve Jobs, mm. right? The, the no effective cure, right? And this really is a, it's a good treatment. We can't use the word cure, mm. but we know that with this, you'll live years longer. So we're really proud of this development. Well, this same isotope is beginning to show huge promise in different molecules, for example, to treat men who've had uh, prostate cancer that's metastasized throughout their body, hmm. right? And uh, great results, right? Uh, now, this is still in the laboratory, first in man sorts of studies around the nation. Mm -hmm. But I think in 10 years, we're likely to see that it too, it, people are going to be talking about extending your life years beyond what we would you would expect to live today with such a disease and uh, the same isotope is showing great promise in women who have metastatic cancer from breast cancer so we're we're, we're quite yeah. uh, optimistic and is that work that you guys do to kind of take that isotope and tweak it a little bit or or is correct that, yeah. so we have faculty on our campus in many different departments involved in creating the molecule that holds the radioactive atom. Other faculty who are doing research on how to take that molecule and attach it to uh, something that makes it go where you want in the body, right? So when we inject it, it goes to this spot and or it leaves the body quickly, right? There's a large team of faculty at the University of Missouri working in this area. That's great. It's great. Very exciting stuff and, and really kind of amazing. So uh, and thanks for joining us uh, this month. And thanks for watching, and uh, Thank good you. night. Thanks, all.